Hello everyone and welcome to another installment for the United Virtual Airlines Training Department. Today we're going to be highlighting the FRA again, however, we're going to be doing it in the Airbus and highlighting some of the differences between the Boeing 737 and the Airbus 320. The aircraft is parked at the gate in Dulles. It is in a cold and dark state. Let's head inside. Now as you'll notice in a cold and dark state, we mean that there's no power applied to the aircraft. Everything is uh, dark and or off. So now that the displays are powered, we take a look at the overhead panel here. The only thing that shows in the description here is the external power button. It has a green avail inscription here. And that is acceptable. It tells us that the ground power is plugged into the ground power receptacle plug in the nose well of the aircraft and uh, the aircraft has taken a look at the external power that is being supplied to it and it has determined that the power is acceptable for use once we go ahead and do select it. Before we do that we're going to go ahead and verify that the aircraft is ready to take power. We want to look and make sure the gear handle is down, uh, the flaps are fully retracted in the zero position and the uh, speed brake lever is in the uh, disarmed position. With that being said, let's go back up to the overhead panel and we're going to start powering up the aircraft. We're going to start by turning on battery 1 first and then battery 2 and then we're going to select the external power. Because the external power is available in there, we could go ahead and just come in here and, and hit the uh, external power button and everything would come up. The reason that I like to do the batteries is that if you don't have the batteries online or connected to the aircraft, there are certain tests that the Airbus will be trying to run through and they will not go well because it's testing to make sure that the batteries are good too. So, with that being said, we're going to check the battery voltage of battery 1. It's over 28 volts. Battery 1 is coming on. Battery 2 voltage is also over 28 volts. That's coming on. Now with the second battery on, you'll see that the uh, panel starting to come alive. We had some lights flicker on. Now we're going to go ahead and turn on the external power or connect it to the aircraft. All the panels are going to be powered, chimes are going to go off, fans are going to come on, buttons are going to light up, and uh, the screens are going to come on as well. So here we go. So you should be able to hear the chimes going off in the background. There's going to be some chirping. And our screens are powering up here. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to start bringing up the McDo's down here, um, as that's where we're going to be doing a lot of our uh, work in setting up the Airbus. So McDo one is already up. McDo two is also coming up. We're going to wait for the screens to power up or run their test. Go ahead and clear out. We go clear out the messages. All right, before we get going too much into setting up the aircraft with the Flight Sim Labs Airbus, which is what I'm flying today, there is a function. Uh, it actually simulates uh, NA cars, which is called ATSU. Now this isn't to be confused with the UVA cars, which is there to capture things such as out, off, on, and in times, and also to capture like fuel that you depart with, fuel that you arrive with to measure your fuel burn. Uh, this A cars is just inside the FS labs, and we can do stuff like import flight plans. Um, we can grab weather, and we can also. Uh, grab performance numbers for the runway that we're departing off of. So I'm going to go in here first on McDo 2. We're going to hit ATSU menu, AOC menu, and we're going to initialize the A cars. The reason we initialize it first is then it allows us to get some other stuff going in the background, but then when we go ahead and actually start uh, programming the box on McDo 1, a lot of the stuff that I put in over here is going to be able to come over to McDo 1. So, we're going to be doing the F R A. So FR A for the flight number. We're going to be departing Dulles. K I A D. 
and arriving KIAD. Now the estimated time and route for the FRA, I estimate the actual flight portion is probably going to take me about 30 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and put ETE of 30 minutes. And now with that all said, over here at the R5 key, I'm going to hit the init data request. And it's going to go ahead and send it off. Now, I'm next going to go to the uh, OFP data here. The reason I'm going here is that this is going to allow my GSX uh, application or add-on, which is going to run in the background and do some things for us. If you'll notice, our current fuel load on the aircraft is 4,560 pounds. That is not enough for the FRA. The reason being is that the FRA wants you to have a minimum fuel load of two hours of fuel at en route fuel burn. Now, a good number or a good figure to calculate a fuel burn on most narrow body aircraft, uh, the Airbus in particular, uh, and also the uh, 737NG, anything other than a MAX or a NEO, uh, basically anything without the next gen engines on it, it's going to burn about 6,000 pounds per hour in cruise. So, two hour fuel load is a minimum of 12,000 pounds because you go 6,000 pounds an hour times two is 12,000 pounds. We're going to go ahead and say that we want to carry a little extra gas. We're going to go block fuel of 14,000 pounds. Uh, let's see here, taxi fuel. Let's just say we're going to burn 300 on the taxi out. And our trip fuel, again, about a half hour, so 6,000 divided by 2 comes out to 3,000 pounds for our trip fuel. Now you'll notice here the STD scheduled departure time is in amber. The reason it's in amber is that it doesn't know when we're going to depart. And it's actually saying the time now is 1529. So I want to make this time within about 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to go 1600 hours. And when I do that, it's going to turn to blue. You'll see now I can go ahead and send it with R6. When I do that, in the background here, you're going to see a window pop up, and it's the GSX interface automatically going, and it says refueling service requested. So now, um, GSX is going to refuel the aircraft in the background while I go ahead and continue doing some other stuff in here. Next, what I would do normally is I would come over here to R2, and I would request weather or ATIS for the airport we're going to be departing from. I'm not going to do that today. The reason I'm not doing that is this doesn't know what I have set up in the sim. This is actually going to go pull real-time data, real-time weather. So for the day and time that I'm recording this, it would go ahead and look for the weather in Dulles, which I guarantee you is not what I have set up in the sim. Again, the FRA wants for no weather loaded, so clear skies and a standard day, 2992 inches on the altimeter, and a temperature standard day would be 59 degrees or 15 degrees centigrade and the ground temp here in Dulles is going to be 14 degrees so I'm not going to go ahead and do that but normally I would do that select that there and then once I have that information I can go ahead and do a perf request I can't do that just yet because we have to go ahead and set up some of our uh, parameters with our options here so payload, UVFRA calls for a standard load of at least 50% uh, passengers and cargo. A good zero fuel number for that is 120,000 pounds. I'm going to go 120.2 and I'll show you why in just a second. So I did 120.2 and the reason it, I did that point two is that over here in crew you'll see it says 2 slash 4. Most domestic carriers uh, in the United States that run narrow body aircraft run the flight attendant to passenger ratio right at the minimum amount of flight attendants for the seats on the aircraft. Now most Airbus 320s are configured as a 150 seat aircraft. Therefore the ratio of uh, 50 passengers to one flight attendant means that there's only three flight attendants on board. So when I go to slash three you'll see my zero fuel weight went back down to 120,000 pounds. So, with that being said, we know that we're going to have 120,000 pounds is our zero fuel weight, and we're going to add 14,000 pounds to that, so that's 134,000 pounds. 
is uh, what our anticipated uh, load is going to be. Now going back into ATSU here, into the AOC menu, perf request. We are not departing out of Denver, we're departing out of Dulles. We're going to be departing off of runway 1, 9, left. And the next, these uh, R2, or L2, L3, R2, R3 are just changing the parameters that it's looking for. So it's asking, are we going to be doing an intersection departure? No. Are we going to be using the anti-ice on takeoff? No. Is the runway wet? No. And are we going to be doing a takeoff with the packs off for increased performance? No. Next. It's going to ask for winds. The winds are calm, so we're just going to go ahead and go 360 zero at zero or zero at zero. And the altimeter setting, it is looking for this number right here or whatever we got off of the weather. It's a standard day, so it's 2992 inches. And it's looking for the ground temp. Now, the ground temp, we would also get off the message, or you can go ahead and sometimes take a look here. And it's not there yet because we haven't done any initialization yet but it's going to be 14 degrees. Now you see I still don't have the ability to send it here. The reason is I have to go to page 2. Now it's asking here, are we going to do a toga takeoff or toga thrust takeoff? That is entirely up to you. Most carriers like to do reduced thrust takeoffs. It is less wear and tear on the engines, uh, which ends up extending the life of the engine. What's interesting to note is that a toga takeoff uses less fuel than a flex takeoff, but a flex takeoff is less wear and tear than a toga takeoff. So we're going to do a flex takeoff, so we're going to leave that as no. Now configuration, what this is saying with it in optimal, it's going to take a look at all the parameters and our weight going off of the runway that we have selected, and it's going to try and come up with the uh, optimum configuration for the flaps to execute a takeoff off of runway 19 left. That's what I would normally leave it at. However, the FRA wants us to do all Airbus takeoffs for the FRA in a flaps one or a flaps one plus F configuration. So there we go, flaps one plus F. Now you'll notice that the uh, send prompt at R5 is still not there. The reason is, is that we have to give it one more bit of information. And that is we have to either, we have to give it its estimated takeoff weight. So estimate takeoff weight would be zero fuel weight plus fuel load, which we said was 134,000 pounds. I'm going to go ahead and put 136 in here, and the reason is, is most airlines like to pad the numbers a little bit to account for an extra bag that shows up, or an extra piece of cargo, or mail, or say there's some non-revs that get on, or, or whatever it is. So we want to go ahead and have a little bit of a fudge factor there, and the reason is, is that Let's say you had a short taxi out. You know, push off the gate, you taxi, and the runway's like right there. You get your final weight message, and let's say we were planning at being 134,000 pounds, and all of a sudden, we get our takeoff data message, and it says that we weigh 134,500 pounds, or even 134,100 pounds. If it's over 134,000 pounds, our numbers are no longer good and valid. We have to get new numbers. So it increases workload. We have to go ahead and send off for uh, new data and uh, that takes time and it can you know potentially lead to some issues where you have to like pull off to the side wait for it to come in uh, 2,000 pounds is an acceptable buffer for most airlines so we're gonna go ahead and hit send and now it's gonna go look for performance numbers for all the parameters that we put in here at 136,000 pounds estimated takeoff weight so now, you'll see here it says uh, messages received. So we're done with the ACARS portion of the uh, setup of the aircraft. Now, we're ready to go ahead and start doing our uh, captain's flow and getting the aircraft ready. We'll go back up to the overhead panel here. And we're going to start top left. We're going to start with the ADARUs and start getting them on online. Now you'll notice here that the ADARUs are not numbered sequentially. It's not 1, 2, and 3. It's actually 1, 2, and 3. Now we want to align them in uh, or numerical order. So we're going to start with 1, then we're going to go to 2, then we're going to go to 3. And when we do that, we're going to go from off to nav, and we're going to look here in this box right here under ADIRS. 
There's going to be an inscription that comes on that says on bat. This is part of the test of the Aderu. We want to wait for that on bat inscription to extinguish or to go out before we go ahead and move on to the next one. So the first one to nav on bat off Aderu 2 on on bat and off eight or three to nav on bat and off uh, next we're going to come down here we're going to hit the ground control button what this does is energizes the CVR so we can do a test and on top of it now the CVR is going to capture anything that is happening on the flight deck from running checklists conversations you name it here we go to do a test press and hold okay that's a good test Next, we're going to go ahead and do, uh, we're going to turn on the uh, groove supply for oxygen. We're going to do that. What that does is it turns on the valve from the tank to supply oxygen under pressure to the masks in the flight deck. There's four of them. Next, we're going to do is we're going to come down here real quick. We're going to skip. We're going to get the emergency lights on and the no smoking signs on. We're going to drop back from the overhead panel and start aligning the aderus. And the reason is, is that I'm going to talk through it and it's going to take a little bit here. So programming the FMGC, we're going to do what's called DIFRIPS. And it's the acronym we use. It's data, init A, flight plan, rad nav, init B, perf, progress, and secondary flight plan. And I know I went through it real quick, but we'll cover that in just a second here. So you see in Amber says GPS primary loss. We're going to go ahead and get rid of that. Okay start off by going to the data page and we're going to go to aircraft status. Now, what we're checking for on the aircraft status here is that the active nav database is current. Now, granted you might be watching this video at a much later date than when I'm recording the video. So, for the intent and purpose of today, this database is current. So we're going to go to the init A. So we go to init A. Now, if we were to go ahead and have a sim brief flight plan uh, in here and we initialize the ACARS properly it would go ahead and bring everything in if I were to hit init request knowing that there's a flight plan floating around in Simbrief and the aircraft is looking forward thinking that they're trying to do it which is completely different from what I'm doing I'm not going to do that we're actually going to build the flight plan manually and to do that we start here top right at R1 you have to input your airport identifier, the ICAO identifier, and then there's this little slash here in the middle. You have to put that in there in order to get the to delineate between the from and to. You can't go K I A D K I A D. It won't work. What we have to do is put the slash in here. So K I A D K I A D. We we'll put that in there, and now you'll see it's got a whole bunch of other information in here. What we can do now is we're going to do the IRS init, and you'll see here it's got a whole bunch of numbers, but most importantly down here at R6 we have a line on ref in blue. We're going to hit that, and now it's going to go to an amber confirm align. Yes, I want to confirm the alignment of the Aderus. And now you'll see it's aligning on reference to Dulles, and it's working on that in the background. Now a flight number. We're going to make this flight number the same as what we had over here with the A cars that we put in in MCDU 2. So we're going to go F R dash A. Now the ground temp. Now that we've gone ahead and aligned the aderus, it's getting air data. You can see here where I was talking earlier. There, 14 degrees. So we're going to go 14 degrees here. And tropo. This is a tropo pause. Now, if you are using SimBrief and you're using the UAL 18 OFP format, right in the block with the cruise altitude, it will have the, the tropo pause. And it's TROP and then like three three digits or three numerical values. Like, say, for instance, uh, trope 435. That would mean that you just put, you know, 43500, zero, zero, and that would go ahead and put the tropo pause there. Again, we're not going to get up high enough to have that be an issue today, so I'm just going to leave it blank. Over here, cost index. Most carriers will run the cost index uh, less than 40. 
And the reason for that is that the uh, these carriers have found that running a cost index greater than 40 for climb results in uh, undesired airframe buffeting. So if you were to run a cost index of even 41 or greater, you could experience airframe uh, vibration as you're climbing out. And they figured out that running it at 40 or less gets rid of that. So you'll not hardly ever see a flight plan that calls for cost index greater than 40. If it does, what you'll do is you'll no matter what come in here and you'll put the cost index at 40 and then once you get up in cruise you would adjust the cost index to a greater value so we're gonna leave the cost index at 40 and I'll show you how to adjust the cost index to a higher value in cruise once we're on like a downwind portion of the FRA uh, now for the altitude you'll notice here it says cruise flight level so if you were to go ahead and say well I'm gonna do the FRA at 6,000 feet you go 6,000 feet you put it in here it's gonna say invalid format or format error you go, oh, how do I do that? So you want to actually do it as FL. So flight level, 6,000 is actually 0, 6, 0. And if you don't know what the temperature is, you can leave it blank, and it will go ahead and go, off oh, a standard lapse rate, the temperature is going to be 3 degrees. Now, if I want to make that bold, all I do is a slash 3. Now, if you want to make it negative, you go slash negative 3. And that would make it like so. And it's important that you have to do a negative to get a negative temperature there. So that is a knit A. After that, so we've done, we're going to go through diffrips as I go through it. So we did the D, the data, we checked the database, everything is current. A knit A, we've done that. Now we're going to go to flight plan. We're going to actually build the flight plan here. Now to build the flight plan, we are going to go start here departure and we're going to find the runway that we're going to utilize the FRA wants you to use runway 19 left now I have 19 left there but I'm not done I have to come down here and go no SID and the reason I'm doing no SID is because there's no uh, standard instrument departure that aligns with the FRA so we're just going to basically take off runway heading and then we're going to vector ourselves around so up here at the very top departure from and then in green KIED we're departing off of runway 19 left. This dash ILS in here tells me that the database knows there's an ILS associated with that runway. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow the airplane to do a runway track after we depart. It's going to take off and then at a certain value it's going to flip to runway track and the airplane is going to give us guidance to track the runway center line. Now if you were departing off of a runway that doesn't have that and you wanted to build a situational awareness track that you can do. I'll show you how to do that here in just a minute. But here we go. We're departing 19 left. There's no SID and there's no transition. Down here we're going to hit the R6 prompt for insert temporary. And now the map isn't up yet but it's going to show up as soon as the uh, aiders complete their alignment process. Which looks like we have about two more minutes before that happens. So while that's happening, I'm going to go ahead and skip down to the next step here. And we're, we're, we're going to build the approach portion of the flight. Now, if we were to go ahead and be able to initialize from a flight plan, what they would do is it would have KID, KID, and it would have all the intermediate or en route fixes here. It wouldn't have any fixes associated with the, the SID, and it wouldn't have any fixes associated with the star or the approach in there. We would have to go ahead and tell the airplane or tell the box how we're going to get from the airport what runway we're going off of and get to that en route section and then on the on the uh, arrival section we'd have to tell okay from this en route fix we're going to do this star to this approach to this runway and again the FRA doesn't have that ability because it's just basically vectors around so we're going to go here and select the arrival we're going to arrive to runway 19 left via the ILS no star Novia, and I know I went a little fast on that one, but here we're going to check. So arrival into Dulles, we're going to arrive on the ILS 19 left, Novias, and no stars. We're going to insert temporary, and that is in there. Next on the diff rip would be RAD. So we did D, I, in it A, flight plan, RAD. So we want to go ahead and reference the RML VOR. So we're going to hard tune the RML VOR that's in there, 13.5. And then we select this uh, bearing pointer right here to point to the VOR. And it'll show up here on the map in just a second as soon as it's done aligning. 
and here we go so it's done aligning you'll see that there so we have KID 19 left and you see this white diamond here that white diamond with the white 1790 coincides with the 1790 here so that's a, just a point that the airplane has created out here for us you also see here white GPS primary and GPS primary here that's telling me that the GPS uh, data is aligned it's referenced it with the GPS as well determined that they are in line with each other and it's going to use GPS to update the ADARUS as opposed to uh, cross-checking with uh, triangulation off of nav aids and stuff like that so we're going to go ahead and clear that message now let's say we were departing off of a runway that did not have an ILS associated with it and we wanted to go ahead and build an extended center line for situational awareness we can do that by coming up here and going to fix info now our reference fix is going to be the airport it's going to start off with the airport we're departing from K I A D. next is going to be the runway today it's one nine left and we're going to input that there and now you'll see KID 19 left is now green there and the radial let's say it was going to be 191 which is the heading that we're going to fly off of runway 19 left and you'll see there there's a dashed blue line coming out off of the runway 19 left center line that it gives me an idea of the runway track that I would want to fly now while we're in here we can go ahead and create some other uh, situational errors keys for us so we're going to select RML and now you'll notice that because it's aligned the database knows where we're at and so it's going to look up anything that has the identifier of AML for RML and you'll notice that the FRA is really close we don't really go beyond about 25 miles away from RML so these three are all out so we're going to select 1L and uh, we're going to go ahead and select the first radial that we want, which is 235. You can see that drawn there. And then the next one that we're going to reference is going to be the 340 radial off of RML. And at that one, we don't want to fly farther than 25 nautical miles away from RML. So I'm going to go ahead and range out a little bit here. And the reason I'm doing that is you'll see this blue dashed circle that's 25 nautical miles uh, or 25 nautical mile radius off of the RML VOR you'll see this is the runway track center line this is the 235 radial this is the 340 radial and then if I wanted to do one more radial there I can go ahead and do RML 355 radial you'll see that last one so that when I cross that radial is when I'm going to want to start my turn in for the localizer so while we have the ND up here, we're going to depart runway center line until we hit 6,000 feet. We're going to turn right, heading 280 until we cross this radial, the 235 radial. Then we're going to turn right to heading a 010, fly north until we cross the 340 radial off RML. Then we're going to turn heading 100 until we cross this radial. Then we're going to turn with us on an intercept for the localizer, 19 left. Pretty simple situational awareness picture I've just created here. So we've done data, init A, flight plan, rad nav. Now we're gonna to go to init B. The reason we're gonna to go to init B is we go back to init and then we go to the second page. Now I need to go back into your McDo 2 and I need to go grab from our payload 120.0, 27.5 and I need to put that up here. So 120.0 and 27.5 and then you'll see here our fueler is done fueling us he gave us 13.9 so we're going to go 13.9 and that is init B so we have all these numbers are in here now now I'm going to go back into ATSU here the AOC menu, receive messages, you'll see performance. We're going to pull up performance here. So you will see here, and again, this date here 
is just because I am telling it that I'm doing it in the summertime because I wanted it to look nice and green. So the sim has said that it's June 21st of 2017 and that's just what it's saying. Um, I didn't adjust the year, the date, I just said standard summer day. So we can ignore that. We're going to check here. It's our nose number. We're going off of runway 19 left. Here's the wind component. Runway's dry. Here's the ground temp, 14 degrees. Anti-ice is off. Altimeter's 2992 inches. Packs are on, and the uh, temperature reference for takeoff of 46 degrees is what, is what it's saying. We just have to check that. We don't really need to verify a whole bunch of stuff there. It's not really important. What is important is right here when we start here. Runway 19 left, full length. And we're going to come over here to make do one and start inputting our performance numbers. V1, 137. So here we go, 137. VR is also 137. And V2, 138. You notice flaps one. Flex takeoff temperature of 70 degrees. So we'll flex takeoff temp of 70 degrees. You'll notice here that the clean speed is calculated at 201 knots. Over here it says it's 203 knots. We're not going to input or change the 203 or the 201 to 203. We're going to actually use this number over here. The difference is that this is what we're actually weighing. This is what we were saying we were going to weigh. And we're not going to change that. Now, thrust reduction, acceleration, altitude. Most carriers for an NADP two departure procedure is 800 feet. If there's an NADP one departure procedure, it's different. The UVA FRA calls for a thrust reduction, acceleration, altitude of 1,000 feet. The airport elevation here is 313 feet. So, if you want, you can even go 13, 13, because that's 1,000 feet. You can let the airplane, it'll do a rounding error, a rounding math, and it's going to round it down to 1310 because it goes to the nearest 10. Well, if we wanted to make sure that we're above that 1,000 foot limit because we're splitting hairs here, we can go 1320. Engine out acceleration altitude, we'll make that the same 1320. Now, we want to remember 201, 201 knots, we're going to hit next phase. And in here, pre-select, we're going to pre-select 201 knots. Now, most carriers will configure the box like this because then they're going to go ahead and accelerate down the runway. If you want to rotate, they're going to rotate the guidance or the vertical pitch guidance is going to pitch you to maintain V2 plus 15 until you reach 1320. At 1320, then it's going to want us to lower the nose, reduce the thrust to climb, and we're going to accelerate. And instead of accelerating to 250 knots, we're going to accelerate to 201 knots. Most carriers want you to climb out at your clean speed until you're 3,000 feet AGL, and then accelerate accordingly, which for, t for us today is going to be 250 knots. So that's been pre-selected there. Uh, next phase, cruise. We'd see our cost index here, what our managed speed's going to be. We could pre-select something here if we needed to. Again, nothing really there. Here you can see that it's destinations estimating that we're going to burn. We're going to land with about 12,500 pounds of fuel on board. Next phase for descent. If we were going up into the flight levels and coming back down from a Mach to an indicated airspeed, most carriers would want to maintain the managed Mach speed until it intersected the indicated air speed of 280 knots. And you'd go ahead and select that by going slash 280. And you would put it in here. <clears throat> now, we're not going to be above 10,000 feet, so our speed limit is going to be 250 knots. So we're going to go ahead and put it back at 250. So that's where you'd go ahead and pre-select like a managed descent speed that you would want. There are a few airports out there, Chicago specifically, that like you to go fast and they don't want you slowing to 280 knots and they want you like 300 knots or better so in that case if I was going into Chicago I would pre-select a managed descent of whatever mock speed I was going to be flying at you know 0.76 0.78 whatever it is until I intersected 300 knots and I would select that there there are more pages in the perf stuff here next would be obviously approach and then to go around 
I'm not going to go ahead and do those yet. I'm going to do those in the air because that's normally when you would do it. Granted, I know all the information for it, but I'm going to show you in real time how to do it, when to do it. So, we have done data, init A, flight plan, rad nav, init B. We've just completed perf. Now we're going to go to progress. On the progress page, what we're looking for is our cruise altitude to be near our optimal altitude and for those to be below our recommended max altitude. Our recommended max altitude is flight level 398. We're cruising at 6,000 feet. Plenty of buffer there. The reason the optimal altitude or cruise altitude is dashes is because the airplane doesn't think we're going anywhere. It can't figure out what the optimal altitude is to fly between Dulles and Dulles because it's just a pattern. So that's going to be dashes right now. But if you were going to be doing a flight, say Dulles down to Fort Lauderdale, or Dulles to San Diego, or anywhere for that matter. The optimal altitude will probably be closer to your recommended max altitude for a shorter flight, and it would be a little bit lower if you had a long transcon, like say for instance, uh, you know, Newark to C Seattle or something like that with an alternate. You might not be able to get all that high, so your recommended max altitude might be down around like say 34, 36,000 feet, and your optimal altitude would be probably about two to 3,000 feet below that. So. That's where we're going to check for that there. Then we're going to come down here to the secondary flight plan, and this concludes our uh, DIFRIPS acronym and setup. We're going to copy active. And the reason we're going to copy the active is that the Airbus does not have an execute key, meaning that you can't go ahead and input stuff in here and see the changes before you execute it. You have to go ahead and just build it and, and send it, and then after the fact look at it and go, okay, I like that, or I don't really like that. So that's why the secondary flight plan is in here. So if you were going to go ahead and want to see a change, like if I fly at a higher altitude or a lower altitude, if I cut a corner here or if I add a fix to go around weather or anything of that nature, what is that going to do to my flight plan? What is it going to do to my, uh, my burn time and my burn fuel? You would go ahead and first come up and go secondary flight plan, copy active, and then it's going to copy whatever the active flight plan is. And then you can go ahead and execute changes in here and then you'll see the changes reflected down here and you can see, okay, do I like that? Do I not like that? And you can compare it from uh, one FMGC to the other FMGC. So you can do like the calculations on FMGC2 if, say for instance, the captain is flying. You could do all the changes in FMGC2, compare them between the boxes and then go either yay or nay. And if you like it, then you just go ahead and hit secondary flight plan, activate, and then boom, away it goes. Another feature that some carriers like to use the secondary flight plan for is say for instance I'm gonna bring up the ND here let's say for instance Dulles is departing 19 left but the ATIS is also saying they're departing off of runway 30 you're like well which runway am I gonna get what you can do is you can come up here to the secondary flight plan and you can change it and you can input runway 30 here and you'll see here let me go ahead and bring the range down now we have ILS, or we have runway 19 left here, but we also have runway 30 over here. And I could go ahead and then go get performance numbers over here for runway 30 for our weight and the conditions and everything else like that. Input it in here by going secondary flight plan and perf. You see I'd input all the information here. And it would be there. And let's say we're taxiing out and they go, oh, change the runway, you're departing off of runway 30. Then all I have to do again is come in and go, activate secondary and away we go we don't have to go ahead and change a whole bunch of stuff it's literally just two keys secondary flight plan activate secondary and then I would hit perf and I would verify that the numbers are, are correct and this would change from one nine left to runway three zero again kind of gee whiz kind of cool high-level thinking about how to set up the box to make it to decrease workload after you push off the gate, I guess, is the best way to put it. So again, we're going to copy active, or copy the active flight plan. Okay, so that concludes the programming of the FMGC for departure, specifically on the FRA, but also if you take those steps and apply it to all of your flights in the Airbus, uh, it'll make flying the Airbus a whole lot easier. So now we're going to go ahead and continue getting the uh, Airbus program. Now here's a, a, a simism with the Flight Sim Labs Airbus is that when you go ahead and select um, power to the aircraft, no matter what, it automatically selects the flight directors on. 
the real airplane does not do that. So I just went ahead and deselected those for now. What I am going to do is I'm going to pull up the upper and lower ECAM screens because we're going to go ahead and start doing some fire tests up here. And actually before we do that, let me turn on the, the overhead lights here and I'm going to turn on... There we go. Alright, getting back here. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to test the fire protection systems of the aircraft. We have engine 1, engine 2, APU fire protection, uh, detection and protection. And then we have cargo, smoke, detection, and subsequent fire protection. When we do the test, we're going to test one, then engine two, then the APU. And when we do that, we're going to, a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen and go off. We'll notice here is that right here where it says no smoking, it's going to change to a, a, a checklist that we have to do to address whatever issue it is that we have. You'll notice here the door slash oxygen page is going to change to reflect whatever system is generating the message. So when I test it, you want to test and hold the button and because as soon as you let go of the button, it stops the test. And we're gonna, when we test it, we're going to see the Agent 1 button is going to uh, illuminate with the squib and the discharge. Agent 2 is going to do the same squib, discharge, and the fire push button is also going to illuminate and it's going to light up red. Master warning is going to go off, and like I said, you'll see stuff change over here. So, here we go. You'll notice in the background the master warning is going. I'm going to go ahead and cancel real quick. So, what you're seeing here is it's saying engine one fire, and then these are what we refer to as blue to do's. And it's basically giving us a step by step checklist right here on the screen that we have to do. So, again, we would go ahead, and if this is real, we'd push the fire button, discharge agent one. And then we'd wait because usually when you push the agent one discharge, it tells you, hey, wait, 30 seconds. All right, did the fire go out? Yes, all right, continue on. And it knows it. And then it's going to go ahead and run through a whole bunch of stuff. And what you see here with this green arrow is telling us that there's more items to this checklist that aren't displayed, and they will come up as we get to them. So, okay, that's a good test. We're going to do uh, engine two. Here we go. Let's see the master warrants going off. Blue to do. Alright, APU. You see that as well. Now, when we do the cargo smoke test, what we're going to do is we're going to press and hold the button for about three to five seconds. And we, we don't have to hold it at that point in time. We can let go. It's going to do the test twice. It's going to do the test once, which usually coincides with about the time that I release the button. And then it's going to go ahead and stop. And then it's going to rerun the test again. So don't be startled if you do it and it does the test a second time. You're like, whoa, what happened? That's totally fine if it happens in short order. Now, if you do the test and then later on down the line, like you know, a minute or two later, it goes off again, I would consider that an actual trigger and I would go ahead and start checking with the ramp to see what's going on. Uh, if we're on the ground, if we're in the air, you shouldn't be testing it in the air. But if you were, then I would treat it as a real uh, in-flight emergency. So here we go. One, two, three. Okay, there's the first test, and here it's going to run it again. All right. So that concludes all of our fire protection and or fire detection and protection system tests. Next, we know the fueler's done, so we can go ahead and select the fuel pumps to on. Go ahead and select those on. Again, that's a simism. I selected cold and dark as opposed to just shutting down the airplane. But there you go. Now the aircraft is ready to start the APU and continue on with what we're going to do. Uh, down here, you have a dome light turned on. Make it really bright in here so you can see the panel better. And then here's the light test. So if we wanted to test every single light and switch in the aircraft, we would go like that. And you'll see it brings up every light on every single panel see here on the main panel as well everything is lit up so we could check to see if there is any bulb that is burned out there is not so we will go ahead and turn that back to uh, bright now one other thing we can do here I'll show you this so we're gonna go ahead and get the APU started because we're gonna get ready for uh, pushback here 
So AP Master Switch goes on and then you hit start and it doesn't start right away and you'll notice that and the reason is, is that there's a flap at the back of the aircraft on the underside that has to open and that is for inlet air for the AP combustion process. Once that flap open inscription is there, the flap is completely open and then it can go ahead and initiate the start sequence. So that's what it's going to do. And then once it gets to about 98% or so, it's going to say APU avail. Or 99, there you go. 99% APU is available. We're going to go ahead and deselect the external power. The reason we do that is that usually when you go ahead and start the APU, the ramp hears it and they go, oh, we can go ahead and start doing stuff. And they're going to come up and bang on the aircraft and go, hey, can we go ahead and pull the ground power? We'll sit there and go, yes, you can go ahead and pull the ground power, but we want to make sure we deselect it first before they do that. And then what I'm going to do down here is verify that the ground air is not on as well. And the reason I want to do that is before I select the APU bleed, make sure that ground air is not connected because ground air and then selecting the APU bleed air, we can supply too much pressure to the ductwork that we can go ahead and rupture some of the ductwork in our air conditioning system. And that's not good. So now we're going to do uh, we're going to do an oxygen test real quick. So to do that, we're going to come down here to this panel, which I will pop up here with the main center pedestal here. We're going to select interphone, select volume, make sure that our speaker volume is up over here, which it is, and then over here is the oxygen mask compartment. Now there's two oxygen masks per panel over here. The forward one would be for the pilot, in this case the captain, and the rear one here would be for the observer or the jump seater, which is right behind the uh, captain here. So if we were to have someone around our jump seat, we would check both masks. We just go check, the yellow balloon pops up there, and we heard the oxygen. Do that, there we go. It's a good test of the oxygen system. Now, we're going to check our window while we're here, make sure it's closed. If we see this red ring around the top of the handle, bottom of the button, that means the window is closed. I'll show you what the description looks like if the window is not closed. That means the window is not closed and locked. That is closed and locked. And you'll see that the window doesn't really move. There's not that big of a difference than here to see it moving. So we want to make sure the window is closed and locked. Next, I'm going to go ahead and start configuring for our uh, flight. Let's say we were to get our PDC in and it was to say United 41 squawk 3542 uh, cleared from Dulles to Dulles via the standard FRA routing depart runway 19 left fly runway heading then as filed. So we go ahead and input our squawk code in here and I'm going to make sure that the altitude reporting is on. Everything else is in standby right now. Now, the standard FRA routing is, we're going to start off by turning on our flight directors first. The reason being is that if you do stuff up here and then you turn on the flight directors, it erases anything you pre-select up here. I'm going to leave it in manage speed because the programming of the FMGC on the perf page is going to automatically do our speeds for us. So I'm not going to select V2 plus 15 here. I'm just going to leave it. Um, and manage speed like that. And again, like I said, it was going to say that we're going to go over uh, basically runway track. We can get that. However, we're going to go ahead and select, pre select the heading of 191 for the FRA. And we're going to go to an altitude of 6,000 feet. So. 6,000 feet is set. Now we could go ahead and do our our briefing here, our takeoff briefing or departure briefing. We would basically brief a whole bunch of stuff beforehand, make sure that you know we're fit for duty, you know, 
that our release is current, pubs are current, and all of that stuff. As for the actual departure itself, we're going to be departing off a of one nine left. The speeds off of runway 19 left or 137, 137, 138. It's a flaps one, leads on, anti ice takeoff. We're going to do a flex temp or reduced thrust. 70 degrees is what we put in there. We're going to call it a standard NADP 2 departure procedure. 1320 is there. For the takeoff, any, we're going to board for anything below 100 knots. Between 100 knots of V1, fire, failure, loss of direction control, or if the airplane talks to us. Meaning any un uninhibited e cams. So if the airplane's talking to us, we know it's bad because the airplane should be inhibiting anything that is not really a big safety related item. Um, after V1, we're going to treat it uh, as an in-flight emergency. We're going to take it in the air. We're going to pitch up about 10 to 12 degrees, get the box on the shelf. What I mean by box on the shelf is this little yellow box right here. If I put the bottom of the box on top of this shelf at the 10 degree nose up attitude it's going to give me about 10 to 12 degrees nose up attitude which is perfect for executing a uh, if we were to lose an engine not even if we have to say an engine fire which is still producing some thrust if we were to lose the engine entirely that's going to give us an optimal deck angle for performance so we pitch up about 10 to 12 degrees get the box on the shelf we're going to center the beta target beta target this is going to turn blue and we want to get it centered with the rudders. As we do that, we're going to feed in the rudder trim. Once the rudder trim is in, which pretty much you just hold it to full, because it's going to take about 17 seconds or more of, of trim, of continuous trim application to get the, the rudder trim set. Once the rudder trim is, is set, we're going to get the autopilot on, up here, autopilot one. We're going to fly to 1320 thousand feet. Upon reaching 1320, we're going to accelerate and clean up to green dot speed. So we're going to lower the nose. We're going to do a couple clicks with the thrust levers. We're going to go from the flex detent back to the climb detent, back to the flex slash MCT. That's going to give us max continuous thrust. We're going to continue tracking out runway heading, 6,000 feet, and then we're going to evaluate our options from there. We'll treat any emergencies that we have to do, declare the emergency, and then we'll most likely come back, which today we'll just execute a right turn to a zero knots. Execute another right turn, zero one zero, and come back in and land. As for that, for the departure itself, we're going to fly runway heading six thousand feet, turn right heading two eight zero until we cross the two three five radial, turn right heading zero one zero until we cross the three four zero radial, turn right heading one zero zero until we cross the three five five radial off of RML, and then we're going to turn to intercept the localizer coming back in for the vigil backup at the ILS two one nine left in Dulles. Um, as for that. The uh, tower departure frequencies are all standard. I would normally tune them in, especially if I was doing a VAT something today, because I'm going to be so focused on teaching and um, talking. I'm probably going to forget a lot of that stuff. We don't expect you to do that on the FRA either, just because uh, we want to see more of the flying aspect than the actual managing of the ra radios. And again, you can think of the hierarchy of flying airplane is aviate, navigate, communicate. So communicate is the very last bucket item there. So really the FRA, we're looking for you to fly the airplane and navigate the routing correctly. Communications, if you can manage to remember it and do it, great. If not, don't worry about it. With that being said, any questions on the departure briefing? No depart or no questions? All right, pre-flight checklist. Pre-flight checklist, pilot and flight attendant briefings. They're complete. Oxygen, check set, 100%. Flight deck windows, closed, locked. FMGC's radio is programmed, set, and verified with the 1FD2 one FD on the PFD here. IRS selectors to the overhead panel, nav. Fuel pumps are on. Altimeters and flight instruments 2992 inches set and checked. Noseful steering disconnect message is displayed. Engine masters are off. Parking brake is set pressure normal. And when we say by pressure normal, as we're looking down here at this route, this gauge, which has basically three kind of quarter circles, 
this top one is the accumulator pressure. There's a green mark there. If the needle is beyond the six o'clock position going towards like seven or eight o'clock position, that is not acceptable accumulator pressure. We would need to charge that by one of two ways. One, we can either wait for the ramp crew to close the cargo doors, or we can go ahead and configure it on the overhead panel and do it that way. And then these numbers here are the actual pressure that's being applied to the parking brakes on the right main landing gear here, left main landing gear here. That's good. So parking brakes at pressure normal. Pre-flight checklist is completed. So let's just say we're getting ready for push here. So we're going to close the door. And we're going to get the crew ready. Jeopardy is coming off, Jeopardy is coming off. We can pull the ground shocks now. There we go. So, before push checklist, seatbelt signs are on. Hello, Captain. Fuel. Ready for pushback. Plan 12,000, 13.9 on board. And the uh, doors, slides closed and armed. Before push checklist is completed. Let's say we called for push clearance. They go push, push approved. Expect for one nine left. Beacon is on, Locked. and the transponder is coming on as well. Now in Dulles, they pretty much just push you straight back. And then save you taxi away from there. Bypass pin inserted. Release parking brakes. Alright, release the parking brakes. Parking brake is off. Commencing push. All engines clear. Start at will. So the all engines clear. Um, with the Airbus, we don't have to do much. All we have to do is make sure we're we're gonna start the engines. Uh, some airports have it where you have to wait until you get to a designated spot to start the engines. Dulles is not that. Uh, kind of an airport. So we're going to come down here, we're going to go mode selector to ignition start, and we're going to take the master up and over the gate, leave it in the on position. And now we're just going to let the airplane do its thing. The airplane will automatically monitor the start, and if it detects any issues or any faults, it will go ahead and abort the start and do the dry motoring procedure for us. We don't have to do anything, no timers, nothing of that sort. And as you'll see, it's starting here. So you see the N2 is coming up. There we go, introducing fuel flow. Or introducing fuel with the fuel flow, and there's the light off in the EGT. The engine starts considered complete when this gray box inscription goes away. So and then it goes back to just a black background. Set parking brakes. Alright, we're gonna set the parking brake. So parking brake is set. Waiting your confirmation for pressure the normal. Start. Confident that we're gonna have a good engine start, so I'll tell him, hey, good engine start. You can go disconnect. Okay, so those are the relays clicking. The uh, generator on the number one engine is now online and taking a load. There we go. So with the engine start complete, we're gonna go ahead and take the mode selector and put it back in normal. By doing that, it's gonna go ahead, and you'll see here in a minute. The APU is going to start supplying air to the packs again. You'll see those fault lights disappear. There's that one. There's that one. Alright. See, it happens automatically. So he's going to say, right is clear, left is clear. We'll give him the uh, flash of the nose taxi light and the salute. Left is clear. Right is clear. Okay. Flash the taxi light and the salute out the window. They're going to walk away. And now we're going to go ahead and do the after start checklist for a single engine taxi. So, first we're going to come up here to the overhead panel. The electric yellow pump comes on. And then down here we're going to go flaps one. And you'll see the flaps one running. Now, on the ground, when you select flaps 1, you get it 1 plus F, which is both leading edge slats and trailing edge flaps. In the air, we're only gonna, when we go from flap 0 to flaps 1, we only get leading edge slats. We do 
and I get trailing edge flaps in the air and you'll see that here in a minute. After start checklist, after start checklist, engine anti-ice is off ecam status. So we'll pull up the ecam status page here and I'm going to go ahead and this button right here, you'll see it is this button right here, the STS button. And as I push it, you're going to see the status page, CAT3 single only, the in-op system is CAT3 dual. And I'm expecting that, the reason I'm expecting that is because we have lost redundancy, meaning we don't have the second engine running. Once we get the second engine running, that will go ahead and take care of that. Another thing we're going to do as well, we're going to arm the ground spoilers, center the rudder trim, and then we would call for taxi. And uh, in, in Dulles, in real world, there's ramp frequencies. For our purpose today, we're just going to call it ground. So, ground, United, 42, ready to taxi. They come back, they go, United, 42, taxi via Echo, and Kilo, 1-9 left. All right. Echo, Kilo, 1-9 left, United, 42. So we're going to go ahead and release the parking brake. And turn on the nose light here. And you'll notice the aircraft is going to start rolling a little bit without any application of thrust. The airplane is kind of a sports car. And when you get the second engine online, the airplane just likes to really accelerate um, at idle thrust. You don't have to do anything really. And um, another thing, too, is that. Most airlines in the world actually have their Airbuses with the brake fans. You'll see that here above the nozzle steering, uh, you need to get nozzle steering message or uh, switch. However, real world United does not have brake fans, and that can create a problem for um, management here. Reason that the brakes have a tendency to build up a lot of heat when you use them. Um, so we want to try and mitigate our use of the brakes so we don't have to do any brake cooling mitigation before we depart. One way we do that is we do a lot of single engine taxis. Uh, that can keep your speed low so you don't have to apply the brakes as much. Another way to do it is to go ahead and allow the speed to build up and then do a long application of the brakes to get the airplane back down to a really low speed and then let the speed build up again. Um, with the um, brakes on the Airbus, a lot of applications actually builds up heat more than a longer application at less frequency. So we would also have gone ahead and tested the brakes real quick. We'll do that, just make sure that they work. So here we go. Yep, brakes work. So that was one quick application. We'll keep an eye on how many applications it takes for us to get to the runway here. So what you notice too is that the thrust has been at idle ever since we uh, were about a quarter of the way through that turn back there. And the airplane's moving along just fine all on its own. Now, speaking about single engine taxi, um, some carriers have to, uh, limits as to what they want for an engine warm up and an engine cool down before you either apply takeoff thrust or shut an engine down. Now, the limit for shutting down an engine isn't a hard one. It's more of a guideline, like we'd like you to get it, but if you don't get it, no big deal. However, the warm-up is a hard limit uh, in most airline operating procedures. The reason being is that if you allow an engine to properly warm up before you apply takeoff thrust, you ensure that the oil is nice and warm, um, and all the, all the parts of the engine have gotten to a proper heat cycle on them so that everything's sealed up, everything's warm. You know, think about like warming up. Like if you were to go exercise, if you were to just, you know, wake up, roll out of bed and immediately go run a marathon, you're going to be hurting. Uh, however, if you were to go ahead and get out of bed, do some stretches, do some light warm ups and stuff like that, and then go run the marathon, you're probably not going to hate yourself as much as if you were to just, like I said, get out of bed and start running a marathon uh, or even a sprint for that matter. So, Talking about that, most airlines like a five minute warm up on a cold engine. Now, what's a cold engine? A cold engine is anything that has not been run uh, within the last 90 minutes. Okay. Um, and then a warm engine is anything that has been run within the last 90 minutes. And that period drops it down to 
a two minute warm up. So, so the time the engine starts, comes online, start the timer, two minutes, good to go. Um, if it's warm. If it's cold engine, again, start the engine, uh, and then it comes online, start the timer, five minutes. And so it's a game of trying to figure out the cadence of like departures off of the runway, your sequence in that line, to make sure you time it just right, especially in the interest of, you know, saving money by not burning any extra fuel that you don't need to burn, but also not putting yourself into a corner where you have to delay departure because you didn't judge your warm-up time accordingly. So, what I'm going to do next, is as we're coming up here, I'd say, hey, let's start engine number two. So, we start by turning off the yellow pump, and then we're going to come down here to the center pedestal. We're going to turn that off. And then we're just going to watch. Again, the FO would be doing all this while the captain is taxiing. Okay, so we're right at about 10 knots. A little bit fast for the turn here, so I'm going to apply the brakes. So that's application number two. Again, didn't need a whole lot of application there just to, to slow it down. And again, with my control setup here, I don't have the ability to just kind of lightly apply brake pressure. It's just an all or nothing, unfortunately, so that's why it's, it's hard like that. Uh, if you were to have the actual ability to modulate the brakes, um, it would be easier to just give it a slight application to slow it a little bit through the turn and then let it go. But again, now what you're going to see here is the engine's going to come online, and as it does, we're going to go ahead and really start to accelerate down the taxiway here at idle thrust. There we go, start the timer. There, pretty open shoot comes on. We are done with the APU, so the APU goes off, and AP, or APU bleed goes off, APU master switch is off as well. Now, with that being said, we can go ahead and do our control checks. I'm going to look down here at the lower ECAM screen, and we're going to go ahead and do it. Checking the stick, full aft, so that's full up elevator. Full down, neutral, full left, full right, neutral, checked. Rudder full left, full right, neutral, checked. So flight controls are checked. Auto brakes go to max now. The reason we don't do that beforehand is that if you do the um, flight control check and you go left to right real quick, with the ground spoilers being up on both wings, it can go ahead and, and trick the airplane into thinking that you're aborting the takeoff and you need to, it's going to apply the brakes. So the airplane's going to come to a screeching halt. It's not really comfortable. You'll notice here that the speed has built up quite a bit. I'm going to go ahead and here's a big application of brakes. You'll see you slow it down quite a bit there. Okay. Just get my uh, FMGC sub so I can run the before takeoff checklist here real quick. You'll see that in just a second. You also notice the timer here coming up on two minutes so again if we were rolling and continuing to go and I wasn't going to go ahead and go through the whole procedure and the engine was warm I'd say we timed it pretty well for a uh, departure off of one night left Okay, you can see the uh, ground speed there on the ND is 11 knots. We're going to go ahead and apply the brakes again. And start the turn. No 
those like those taxi light goes off as we come up here to the runway hold short. And I'm gonna stop here. Brakes are set and pressure is normal. Now I'm gonna reference our takeoff CG. There we go. So, we're going to run the before takeoff checklist. Before takeoff checklist. Alright, so here we are holding short of the runway. We're going to get ready to depart. The final weights are in. Uh, we weigh 133.4, change in negative 600 pounds. Speeds for the assumed weight of 136. Yeah, speeds for 136,000 pounds are 137, 137, 138. Set. Flaps. One final. One plus F indicated. Thrust. Thrust. 1.288 flex E per set. FMGC's runway. One nine left set. Trim twenty. Trim twenty seven point five zero set. FCU manage speed one nine one six thousand is set. Departure announcement. Flight attendants, please be seated for departure. Uh, departure analysis is complete. Flight controls checked. Takeoff memo is going to be green. We're going to check that here by pushing the takeoff config test, which is right here. Takeoff memo is green. Ecamm status. See that normal? It's checked. And the transponder is traffic before takeoff checklist is completed. So now we would go ahead and call for takeoff. Tower United 42, 19 left, ready for departure. There you go, United 42, runway 19 left, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, 19 left, United 42. So we would look left, make sure final is clear, it is clear, and there's no traffic on the runway, no conflicts. And we're going to do a rolling takeoff for the FRA and UVA FOM. So we're going to increase the thrust. Let the engine stabilize. Everything looks good. And we're going to advance it here two clicks. One, two. And I like to use this view for takeoff and approaching it. So set thrust, thrust set, man flex, SRS, runway. Knots. V1, rotate. Positive rate, gear up. And there's runway track. Four hundred feet. Pull for the uh, heading. Okay, there is lever climb. So it's flashing lever climb. We've reached 1320. We want to lower the nose. Reduce our thrust. Climb. 
There you go, thrust climb, open climb. And now, normally I would hand fly a little bit more, but I'm trying to verify that I'm talking appropriately. So the autopilot one is on. So, as we climb out of 4,120 feet, we can go ahead and we'll go ahead and push for managed speed, which will allow the airplane to accelerate to 250 knots. You'll see here on the PFD, let's zoom in just a little bit, this green S, that is the slat retraction speed that we have as we accelerate towards our green dot speed. go so we can go ahead and retract these slats so it flaps up we're going to disarm the ground spoilers and you'll see now that it's going to go for green dot speed here which is what the speed is set at you'll see this yellow hash mark right here that is the maximum flap extended speed for the next flaps configuration which right now we're flap zero so that would be the max flap speed for flaps one in flight go. So now we can go ahead and accelerate. So we're going to push for managed speed. <clears throat> You'll see and hear me talk and I'll refer to it as like push or pull. The reason is push or pull. Here we go. Uh, 4,000 climbing. 5,000. One to go. The reason you'll hear me say push or pull is that pushing it is giving it to the airplane. You're like telling the airplane, hey, you take care of it. And then if you're pulling it, you're taking control away from the airplane. You're saying, no, I want it. I'm going to handle it or I'm going to do it. There you go. Speed. Alt star. Upon reaching 6,000 feet. We're going to go ahead and turn right. There you go. Alt cruise. We're going to turn right. Hitting 280. And we're going to run the after takeoff checklist. After takeoff checklist, gear is up, flaps are up, ECAM memo checked. We're not checking the status, we're just checking the ECAM memo, making sure there's no messages here that we are, need to be aware of. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the turn off lights and the nose lights. The landing lights in the wing root area, we're going to leave extended. Those have a speed limit of 250 knots. I mean, we don't want to have them extended for greater than 250 knots. So. Most of the time you're going to be uh, turning those off and stowing them as you're climbing out of 10,000 feet. Um, however, if you're flying like out of Chicago, the Chicago SID calls for the speed of 250 knots until advised by ATC. So even though you'd be above 10,000 feet, if you're slower than 250 knots, you would have them out until you start to accelerate beyond the 250 knots. So down here on the ND, you'll notice that we are only 11... 11 and a half miles away from the RML VOR as we start our crosswind turn. Now we can go ahead and we can start getting set up for the uh, rest of the flight here. So what I'm going to do, pull up the FMGC1, you'll see it says enter destination data. That's it saying, hey, I know that you're close to the airport that you're going to be arriving at and you haven't given me information that I need. We will get to that in just a minute here. First, what we're going to do is we're going to start cleaning up the box here. We no longer need this reference. So I'm going to go ahead and clear it out. Next was asking perf. So you notice like when we did perf, we had takeoff, and then we had climb, and then we had cruise. Well, we skipped the climb because of such a short duration from field elevation to 6,000 feet. We didn't have time to take a look at it. Now, if we were at cruise and we wanted to have a cost, or we needed to run a cost index of greater than 40, now would be the time to do it. And what we would do is we would come in here and we'd say, oh, we're going to run the cost index at 60. Then we would do it, and it would change anything that we needed to. However, because we're speed limited at 250 knots, the cost index between 60, 0, and 120 isn't that big of a deal. So you look at 0, it doesn't change anything. Um, speaking of cost index, I forgot to mention it earlier. While most Airbus operators don't run a cost index of greater than 40 for the climb, most Airbus operators also do not run a cost index greater than 120 for all the phases of the flight. And it's just you don't really save all that much. You don't. You, you spend more fuel than you do saving time at a cost index of greater than 120. Here we are. We're coming up to our radial, the 235 radial that we drew. With the, the dashed blue line is here, and you'll notice that it's not. 
it, it's moving as it comes this way. This pointer is really what we want to reference when we start our turn. And we're going to wait until this pointer, this tail pointer, is right here at 235. And then that is crossing the radial. We'll start our turn to 010. All right, that's radial passage we're crossing. Right turn, zero, one, zero. Okay, now while we're starting the turn, you'll notice here at L6 it has activate approach phase. I do not want to hit that yet. One, because I haven't inputted any information to the approach phase, but two, I'm in managed speed over here. So what would happen if I were to go ahead and hit activate approach phase, what it's going to do is it's going to try and slow the airplane down to our approach speed of 135 knots as configuration allows. The airplane will not just slow to 135 knots. What it would do is it would first slow to green dot speed, which is down here probably around like 200 knots or so, until I went flaps one. And then it would slow to the slowest speed that it can do in a, just a slack configuration until I went to flaps two, flaps three, so on and so forth, until it got back to 135 knots. So we want to be careful about activating the approach phase, making sure that we're either ready for it or we're in selected speed so that it doesn't automatically start slowing down on us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to range out here so you can see where we're at in relation to the airport. You'll see that we haven't quite come up a beam it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to input the uh, information that I would get off of the weather from the ACARS, but I know what it is. The altimeter is 29, oh, I forgot, you had been decimal decimal 9.2. The ground temperature is 14 degrees and the wind is 0 at 0. It's going to be flaps full. You see it here. If I want to do a flaps 3, I could select it by going here. Or really, I'm going to do a flaps full. Uh, barometric. So, because we're doing a visual backup by the ILS to 1.9 left, the minimums, if we were going to be doing it in IMC conditions, it's 502 and the reason we're going to put it up here at Barrow is that if it's a DA decision altitude or an MDA minimum descent altitude it's an altitude that's Barrow if it's anything like a decision height that is uh, a, a specific height above the ground and that can uh, and we want to have that off of radial altimeter so if it's begin if it ends in an A whether it's a decision altitude or a minimum descent altitude it is Barrow. If it's a decision height, it's radio, and it will go there. Uh, you'll see here my minimum clean speed is 199 knots. As I just said, I thought it was around 200 knots. Indeed, there it is. Uh, here we go. We're passing a beam the airport. Normally, the FRA would have you slow to 210 knots right now. I am not going to do that just yet. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to pull you'll see it's 250 knots and now I can go ahead and activate and confirm the approach phase and now you'll see the airplane is in approach mode meaning I can't go to anything before the approach so it it thinks from here on out it's going to do an approach phase and then if we don't land we're going to do a go around now here thrust reduction acceleration altitude 1320 1320 and in the event that we lose an engine, 1320 as well. Okay. So, perf is done. We're going to slow accordingly here. Now would be an excellent time to brief the visual backup by the ILS to 19 left. Uh, that's plate 21 5, the localizer frequency. We're going to go ahead and select LS here. And I'm going to go ahead and come over here and select LS as well. I'm going to pull up the PFD here so you can see it better. The localizer frequency is 110.1. The final approach course is 191. Top of the approach is DOMSI at 1,700 feet. We're going to take it down to, like we said, 502. Uh, the, we're going to be looking for an LSF2, Pappy on the left-hand side. If we don't like that, don't like them. So we're going to go miss. Straight ahead, 800 feet. Climbing left turn, 3,000 feet via the 010 heading. Intercept the 040 radial off of the RML VOR. Out to the Asper intersection and hold. 
Barring that, if it's a good approach and a stable approach to landing, we're going to land 19 left, which is 11,500 feet. Plan on exiting at Kilo 7. I am not going to use any auto brakes for it. Let me start slowing 210 knots. I'm not going to use any auto brakes. Be right turn off Kilo 7, and then we'll taxi to the gate via Juliet and probably Delta or Echo to whatever gate we so choose. Gonna have a positive change of flight controls if it was the FO doing the landing to the captain and uh, transfer to control of the captain before departing the uh, runway center line. And there's no real terrain or obstacles to be concerned with, so we're good to go. Any questions? No questions. Alrighty, time for the descent checklist. Descent checklist ECAM status is checked. Check that here. So, when it says status, we want to check the actual status button. Okay, ECAM status is checked. Landing distance and auto brakes checked, none set. V approach, 134, flaps full, set. Ravel briefing is complete, the descent checklist is completed. You'll notice here, too, on the PFD, that my selected speed of uh, 210 knots is more than 10 knots above my minimum clean speed of 199. The air is smooth because there's no turbulence going on. There's no wind gusts or buffeting or anything like that. So I have a pretty good margin off of my low speed awareness uh, here. If, for some reason, I was in some turbulent air and I was concerned about stall protection system or low speed protection. I could go ahead and go to flaps one. And here's a good time to talk about this. So this mark right here is the airframe limitation of the next flap extension speed, which would be flaps one. However, most carriers like to give it a 10 knot buffer. So 220 knots or less is where I would go ahead and select flaps one. You'll notice here that my pattern has taken me out a little bit farther than 25 nautical miles. I'm going to go ahead and initiate the right turn to 100 just to keep it a little bit tighter. Again, that 25 nautical mile ring is kind of for situational awareness. You'll notice as I uh, am in the turn, the tiger tail which is what we referred to, has kind of closed the gap on the low speed awareness part, which is that. And then as I roll out, the tiger tail will go ahead and decrease in speed. Again, that's as we start to decrease the load factor on the airframe. So here you go, as it's rolling out, you'll see Tiger Tail is decreasing in speed. And now would be an excellent time to start slowing to 180 knots. We're gonna go ahead and go flaps one. We'll slow to 180 knots. And I'm gonna go ahead and select 3,000 feet. And again, as we slow below, or as we slow to the speed 10 knots below 200 knots, which would be 190 knots, we'll go to flaps two. There's flaps two. And now that we have it, we're going to go ahead and pull for the open descent. So you see thrust idle, open descent, and we're descending out of 6,000 feet now. What you'll see here, this upload up here, 
this little blue arrow right here is showing where the airplane is anticipating me reaching the altitude I'm descending to 3,000 feet, which is going to be right there. And if the arrow was the other way, if the line wasn't going up but it was coming down or basically down and up, it would be where I was going to reach the altitude in climb that I had selected there. There we go, crossing the radial. I'm going to turn. And let's say we're talking with the approach. Approach said, hey, you're clear for the approach. We could go ahead and actually hit the approach. So it would be maintaining three until established, clear for the ILS, one nine left approach. Now, as we come in on the approach here, uh, the Airbus has been designed so that it will come down on a 3 degree glide slope at 170 knots with flaps 3 at idle thrust. And uh, I'll try and demonstrate that here for you in a minute. But we're going to continue flying at 180 knots because that's what the FRA calls for. Um, and you'll find that in the real world application most airlines uh, and, and approach controllers run the speed at about 180 to 170 knots depending on uh, load here coming into uh, most of the airports. Here they go, Loke Star. This is going to initiate a right turn to capture the localizer here. I'm going to zoom in one. Again, this is a view that I prefer for the uh, takeoff portion and the approach to the landing portion of flying this airframe. So as the glide slope comes alive, you'll see that here. When we get to about one dot low, I'm going to slow the speed to 170 knots and I'm going to go to flaps 3 and it should coincide that we intercept the glide slope uh, at 170 knots, flaps 3 and the thrust should just start spooling up a little bit. And This will help with energy management coming in. There we go, glide slope's alive. back to 170 knots. And flaps 3 selected. At this point in time we'll be talking to the tower controller. Tower controller probably tells us to play land. 1-9 left. So the lights are coming back on. Speed. Glide slope star. And you'll see here glide slope is captured now. Speed is 170 knots. We're on the glide slope. And over here you see the idle flashing. We're at idle thrust. And again, not gaining any speed, not losing any speed. This is dependent upon wind. That's the other caveat. It's heavily dependent upon wind conditions. What you also notice is that when we go ahead and configure for landing, 
uh, a good EPR value, which you get EPR with the IAE engines, which is what Real World United operates instead of CFM engines. A good EPR value on most thrust or weights is about 1.04 to 1.06 um, EPR value. So I will show that here. We're going to go ahead and go man speed. Gear down. On the spoilers. The auto thrust is off. You'll see that here. It's because we're in the armed motion now. And now we can go ahead and go flaps full. Landing checklist. Landing checklist. Gear down. Spoilers arm. Flaps full. Landing memo green. Landing checklist is completed. I'm going to go ahead and let the autopilot handle the uh, last minute adjustments here. And as we start to slow, I'm going to slowly start bringing in the thrust. The engines take a little bit to respond. We're going to look for about 1.57. Let's see what we get for a thrust per a speed with that. Okay, autopilot's coming off. Okay, I'll cut this off. And I'm going to zoom in just one more so I can one still side. see the um, PFD. I can still see the speed, the altitude. I'm looking more for lateral tracking off of the runway because it's a visual. And I'm using the glide slope indication inside to maintain profile. I can see I'm getting a little high, so I'm going to back the thrust off a little bit. There's a thousand feet, clear to land. Feet stable. Hundred above. Minimum. spool down before I close the reverse so I don't have an acceleration forward and stone the reversers I'm gonna exit at the high speed here the forward high speed and FO would start the timer for the engine cooldown. Now normally the uh, Airbus is a two-man crew. The captain becomes the pilot flying on the ground no matter what. The first officer is the pilot monitoring. Pilot monitoring does all of the configuration changes while the pilot flying handles all of the manipulation of the aircraft on the ground. Uh, if you are unfamiliar or unsure with your handling of the aircraft or being able to taxi, recommend stopping clear of the runway before you taxi to do any configuration changes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and for the uh, interest of keeping the video time down, I'm going to just continue to taxi and then I'm going to go ahead and once on this center line here I'm going to transition to an FO roll and 
to start reconfiguring. So we're tracking the flaps, disarming the speed brakes, turn that off, take a break, come back over here, get the airplane back on the center line, turn the TCAS to standby, and APU master switch on. The reason for the APU master switch on, especially in the Airbus again, is the giving the flap door uh, enough time to open so we can go ahead and start it really quickly because that's what takes a big chunk of time. Now we're coming up to two minutes, so we have one more minute of cooldown and then we can go ahead and select or go ahead and set up for a single engine taxi. Again, to control the taxi speed, also to help save some gas. And the captain would go ahead and turn off lights. There we go. You notice I'm letting the speed build up a little bit here. I'm going to go ahead and bleed it off. Okay, coming up on two and a half minutes. Two minutes and 40 seconds. And getting set up for single engine taxi, electric hydraulic pump comes on again. And there's three minutes. And we just go engine master switch off. Coming up on Delta, we're going to slow the aircraft. And again, I apologize for the braking. FO would go ahead and select the APU on. Captain would turn off the master or turn off the taxi light as we turn into the gate here. And you'll notice the APU should come online right about the time that we come to a stop here on the J line. APU. APU avail. Shut them down. Okay, parking checklist. The Park your brake is set, pressure normal, spoilers, disarmed, engine masters are off, radar, predictive wind shear, off and off, transponder standby, slides, disarmed, beacon is off, anti-ice is off, fuel pumps are off, APU is running. And that ladies and gentlemen concludes our flight in the Airbus 320 by FS Labs on the United Virtual Airlines FRA. Hope you enjoyed. Have a good day.